Welcome to the Challenging Conversations podcast, where we tackle some of the most pressing and controversial issues of our time with a biblical worldview. I'm your host, Jason Jimenez, and today we're addressing the ongoing controversy following the Olympics in France about this gender identity policies that they've been implementing in the participation of transgender athletes in women's sports. As the international committee continues to move forward with these type of policies of gender identity and transgenderism, what are we to think about these things? Are we to argue that this is in fact promoting inclusivity, that this is fair-minded towards people who are born female? Are we to express concerns about the safety and the fairness about what is taking place? And what are the long-term effects or how viable are these decisions for female athletes in general? Are these policies that we're seeing being advanced on the worldwide stage actually about equality or is there a hidden agenda at play? That's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be asking these tough questions on today's podcast. For example, how safe and fair is it really for women athletes to compete under these new regulations in the Olympics moving forward? What is the International Olympic Committee's real motivation in promoting the rise of transgender athletes in traditionally female categories? And perhaps most crucially, what should we all be aware of so we don't blindly accept these changes without understanding their full implications? You see, my friends, a lot of people avoid the controversy surrounding transgender athletes, but I believe it's important for Christians to stay informed and ready to challenge the narratives that seek to undermine God's creation of male and female on the global stage. So let's dive into this challenging topic and seek to understand how we as believers can not shy away, but rather respond with reason, wisdom, and compassion. So recently I was putting together an article that you guys can check on the Higher Ground Times, which is the Washington Times, which they also feature on the Washington Times, my weekly column that is available as this podcast is is produced and brought to you by the Washington Times. So check those things out. Make sure you guys become a member as I am. They have great articles that help us understand the culture that we're living in. And of course, with our partnership, we want to be able to bring a biblical worldview uh, in my opinion columns as a Christian thinker. And so I want to actually take some time and read to you guys a fictitious story, okay? I just want you to be clear. I made this up, but this is based off of years of examining this growing movement of trans athletes, particularly men who think they're women competing in women's sports. So let me read this for you guys as we get started. Lindsay's passion for boxing ignited at a young age when she would watch her father's intense sparring matches. As she grew older, her father recognized her natural talent and potential in boxing. With her father as her coach, Lindsay harbored a dream of one day representing her country and the Olympics. Even with the demands of school and work, Lindsay committed herself to rigorous training in the early hours. She took part in local tournaments whenever possible, showcasing her remarkable skills in the ring and ultimately rising to become one of the top female boxers in her country. Lindsay found herself catapulted into the unexpected position of representing her country at the Olympics. It was beyond her wildest dreams to have the chance to become an Olympian with a real possibility of winning gold. Feeling the weight of her nation's hopes and expectations squarely on her shoulders, she didn't shy away from it. Instead, Lindsay wholeheartedly embraced it. She committed to intense training, pushing her body to its limits and meticulously studying every potential opponent she might face in the Olympic ring. Her journey to the semifinals was challenging She encountered tough opponents and with their unique style and strengths. However, Lindsay emerged victorious, defeating one opponent after another. Each win brought her closer to her ultimate goal, Olympic gold. 
Once a young, unknown boxer from a small town, Lindsay now has the entire nation rallying behind her. She's become a symbol of strength and perseverance for young girls everywhere who look up to her. Lindsay felt more nervous as she entered the semifinals than in her previous matches. All her former opponents were familiar faces, either from college or past tournaments. However, her opponent across from her in the ring was unlike anyone she had ever faced in her illustrious in her lustrous career. As Lindsay looked over to size up her opponent, her chest pain intensified and her usual fierce confidence wavered. When the bell rang and her opponent charged the center of the ring, Lindsay's nervousness escalated into sheer fear and panic. It wasn't just any competitor she was about to face off against. It was a trans woman with seemingly insurmountable biological advantages. No matter how hard she tried, Lindsay faced a challenge unlike any other. Her opponent's strength, speed, and agility were beyond natural, leaving her feeling overwhelmed. But Lindsay refused to let her fear overshadow how her ambition to win the Olympic gold was going to go away. She wanted to fight. And so with great determination, she moved forward, skillfully dodging punches to protect herself. In that critical moment, Lindsay lunged forward to attack, but she was met with a powerful hook to the side of her head, instantly rendering her unconscious. Lindsay survived after months in the hospital, but that bout with a trans athlete marked the end of her boxing career. She decided to hang up her gloves for good. Now, I want you guys to understand that even though this is a fictitious character, Lindsay the Boxer, that I wrote in my column, that doesn't mean that these stories are not real. There are several. Matter of fact, there's too many to count at this point when we were even doing research for this podcast about stories of similar details of that of what I wrote about. But my fictional story It highlights the fundamental unfairness that's surrounding the participation of transgender athletes and the outright danger uh, they impose on biological women, that is to say, real females. This is not just a sports issue, I want to be clear, because as I was doing investigative work that I want to bring to the show every single week, whether I bring in world-class Christian thinkers to interview and to talk to to help you guys Uh, address whatever challenging topic that we're talking about, or I come to you directly as your friend to bring something like this that's so very controversial and that a lot of Christians want to talk about, but they don't know how to go about talking about it. But as we do research for you guys to bring these things up and to show you what to, you know, what to handle in such a way, if you will, when, when, when something like this maybe comes up, I would tell you it's disturbing. There is a hidden agenda that is very clear that in many ways, the International Olympics Committee is not hiding. You got to understand that this is when all sports are merging, if you will, whether it be Winter Olympics or the Summer Olympics. So every single two years when the world's coming together for Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics, when you're having almost 200 plus countries gathering together and you have a 112 member team that makes up this committee, They are introducing policies, my friends, uh, every two years, okay? In some cases, every four years. It may seem like this is about fairness and safety, but it's not. There's a deeper thing going on here. For example, at the recent 2024 Olympics in France, the International Olympic Committee partnered with GLAAD. You know what GLAAD is? GLAAD is the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. And they've been around for quite some time. And they partnered, think about this, they partnered with the International Olympic Committee. Why? Because they wanted to participate in co-creating what is known as the portrayal guidelines that every single country was submitted to when they were bringing in qualified athletes from their country, no matter the sport. And it states this, quote, to highlight the ways in which we can all help, catch this, to shift 
how women in all their diversity in other minority groups are seen and how they see themselves. In fact, I want to show you guys this in particular. This is on, again, the Olympics.com forward slash IOC forward slash gender dash equality and then forward slash portrayal guidelines. And it says here, and again, they're showing all these pictures of diversity. It says sports coverage plays an important role in shaping gender norms. Think about this. I'm a Gen Xer. There was no talk, no matter what type of sport you were playing. I grew up in Arizona where they're saying, hey, we want sports to be about gender norms and stereotypes. No, it was about getting kids out there to play on a team, to learn how to play as a team and not to just be you know, self-indulgent, to exercise, to be disciplined, to learn about behavior, to run suicides as I did when you're when I was playing and you know basketball, if you did something the wrong way that the coach did want you to do. And now it's about sports is about shaping gender norms and stereotypes and promoting new positive diverse role models. What does that mean? Meaning over time they want, I'm going to show you guys in a minute. They want LGBT+ plus athletes to become the norm, to become the diverse role model for the world to see. So this is worldwide stage. This is why, you guys, this is huge. Then it says, however, there are still some fundamental differences in how sports women and women's sports are portrayed in comparison to that of men. Now, I have two daughters I'm raising, along with two boys. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the men in my life, but also, and I would say primarily, my mother who I lost at 15 years old, but the inspiration that she was in my life and the stability that she brought me for the short years I had her, I had with her and my two grandmothers. So I'm all about advancing women, their voice, what they can do, everything. So I get it when you want to address about how women are portrayed, okay, biological females. You know, they're not just sex objects, things like that. I'm totally with him on that. But this is far more than just that, okay? Now, at first glance, though, when you see something like this, you're thinking, oh, okay, yeah, this, this is actually really good. They, they're wanting to make a difference. It appears that the, the International Olympic Committee, they're striving to uphold the dignity and the respect and the safety of women athletes that are born female. But unfortunately, when you take a closer look, not just what we saw on display for the two weeks during the Olympics in France, and boy, there's a lot there, but I want to stay focused on my task in the podcast today about trans athletes. When you go through the portrayal guidelines that was co-created with GLAD, with the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation Movement, you see Throughout this guideline book, things like this, for example, protocol for all trans and non-binary athletes saying, quote, every person, irrespective of their gender identity or sex variations, has a right to practice sport without discrimination. So right there, right off the bat, what is that telling you? If you're trans, if you are a biological male and you say that your gender identity or you wake up today and your gender is fluid and you feel like you're a woman. And in some cases, depending on the sport, and we'll touch on one as a boxer in a minute, you go through, quote, what they refer to as sex testing to test basically your hormones. Or when did you start receiving hormone blockers or, or, or the reversal of that prior to puberty, right? They, they have all these new regulations that are saying that they're really trying to advance, again, dignity and respect in women's sports. But that's not what it says here. It says, irrespective of their gender identity or sex variations, they have a right to practice sport without discrimination. So any trans person, basically, they are going to push forward regardless of whatever type of standard or regulations or the, you know, the testing of their testosterone or how long they've been on puberty blockers. Because they want it to be 
about respect, their health. They want it to be about respecting their safety and their dignity. And then they go on to say, this is the International Olympic Committee, there, these principle of fairness, inclusion, non-discrimination, and harm prevention is what they value the most. So it's not at the heart of it is not women. It's not biological women. It's not about female sports. It's about advancing people of different gender identity and sex variation. So you can't have it both ways, you guys. I want to point this out. We cannot be fooled by this. We cannot be drinking the Kool-Aid of this progressivism, the social constructs that they're situating here that are contrary to the Bible, to the creational order of male and female, respectively. You can't say that we are about the protection and the identity and equality of women in women's sports Yet at the same time saying we could not show any discrimination that all people of whatever gender identity catch this sex variation. What an interesting terminology that we don't oftentimes hear. You hear of sexual orientation. You hear of gender identity. You hear of gender fluidity. But now you're hearing this sex variation. So is the... IOC truly prioritizing the protection and promotion of female athletes? Are they really about advancing their accomplishments? Remember, this past uh, Olympics was 50% of the medals were going to go to women. They already wanted to put them on equal par with men. But the question is, what good is that going to do when you're going to be giving opportunity for women while at the same time giving opportunity for men who think they're women to compete against these women. And I'm going to show you some stats in a minute that come from Alliance Defending Freedom. Or do you think, or do you think that they're trying to advance a social agenda that could potentially undermine not just female athletes, but as a direct attack against the creational order of manhood and womanhood? Yes, I'm sure you guys have seen by now that it is clearly the latter. The IOC is being guided. Now, on the front, they want to talk about principles of fair play. They want to talk about safety. They want to talk about protection. But I just need to use one example to disprove that that is really the principle that is guiding them. One example and that is the Algerian boxer, Im Iman Khalif, who they let compete in women's boxing. And did you know that Khalif, in that division, in his division, because as not a woman, and you can have Mike Tirico and everybody else centered around because they're afraid of losing their job, they could refer to Khalif as a she or her saying that's her proper pronouns when biologically this is a male. So when you paint it up to make it look like, no pun intended, that this is a female, you're not fooling anybody. In fact, here's the sad reality is when you guys actually look into what took place here at the Olympics with, uh, it says the IOC defends allowing boxer to fight as woman despite prior disqualification over, catch this, sex ID test. That's where we're at, folks. The Olympics is defending its choice to allow Italian female boxer Angelina Carini to fight Algerian opponent, I think it says, the, you pronounce the name, Imon Khalif, a fighter who was previously disqualified from the women's boxing after a sex identification test. Every person has the right to practice sport without discrimination, the International Committee says. And the Paris 2024 Boxing Unit said it in a statement, quote, All athletes participating in the boxing tournament of the Olympic Games Paris 2024 comply with the competition's eligibility and entry regulations as well as all applicable medical regulations set by the Paris 2024 Boxing Unit. Okay. So the article here at the National Review goes on to say that the Olympics said it measures the age and gender of athletes based on their passport in addition to the Paris 2024 boxing regulations. And I've read to you guys some of the of just, 
you got you got to understand they have the medical guidelines, but this portrayal guidelines is what trumps anything and everything. It's again that that's like that you can have certain policies and things that you have to go through a regulatory process, but nothing can undermine, if you will, their constitution of what their bylaws are, and that is no one should be discriminated irrespective of their gender identity and their sex variation. So in this case, Khalif, a biological male who says he identifies as female, comes into the Olympics to compete. And when you go back to that classic, sadly, and now infamous moment where Carini, the Italian boxer who liked the fictitious character, that I told you before with Lindsay, the boxer comes in here pursuing gold, but only took 46 seconds in the ring to bow out because her opponent was unlike she had ever faced before. And that's what she even said afterwards, but she was too embarrassed and too afraid of the system. These social constructs to say anything against Khalif. And it's almost like these women are proud to lose to a man who thinks that he's a woman. And guess what? Khalif eventually, like you said, wins gold. That's, I mean, you think about it. I mean, that's just, it's so astonishing. Astonishing when you see what is taking place. Now, when challenged again, when, when, when people, there's an uproar around the world about this biological male who's going around beating up biological females and people are saying, what business does this man, why is the Olympics allowing this man who thinks he's a woman, who says he's a woman, why are, why are you allowing this? Well, again, this is what they reinforce. Quote, a person's sex category is not assigned based on genetics alone, and aspects of a person's biology can be altered when they pursue gender-affirming medical care, end quote. That's their response. But what, what on earth is gender-affirming Medical care. Remember, you guys, a sex change is now referred to as gender affirmation surgery. All they have to do is change the wording and basically force people to use it. Otherwise, they'll be fired. Case in point, let me show you guys what happened. Actually, yeah, let me show you guys this. And I'm going to give you guys some stats from ADF. Listen to this. Being This, this is Nikki Hiltz setting the stage for other transgender athletes on NBC Sports. Listen to this interview. Okay, tell us a little bit about what it's like as a professional athlete coming out and the process that that was like over, honestly, it seemed like over years where you shared a little bit more of yourself to where you came out finally as a non-binary non transgendered athlete. But tell us a little bit about how that whole process was for you. Yeah, so um, I came out on Trans Day of Visibility, uh, March 31st, 2021. And um, yeah, it was kind of, I mean, a big thing I, I always go back to is representation of the queer community. And um, at that point, uh, I had had enough representation of other trans people not being afraid to show up and take space and I think it was finally time for you know I, I felt confident enough like yeah I have this identity and I think it's time to share um so yeah it was definitely a process and and as soon as I came out it was scary and terrifying but it was also such a relief to you know show up as myself and like um yeah and I I identify as trans non-binary and I use they them pronouns uh, kind of the best way to describe my gender is fluid um I don't identify as a man or woman somewhere beyond and in between that space um but yeah I think it was it was kind of a a cool moment back back then and it's it's been almost two years since so um it's cool to see the world catching up and and using my pronouns more and more frequently and seamlessly Okay, so you see, guys, this is what they want. This is what they want. They pride themselves in this space. In fact, the same network that holds and, and promotes the Olympics, NBC, were boasting that they were going to have 193 LGBTQ athletes. So when they talk about fairness, inclusion, equality, it's not for biological female athletes. This is about 193 LGBTQ athletes. And the one that was prominent on stage is non-binary athletes like Nikki Hiltz, who says that she's between a man and a woman and her gender identity herself 
in quotation marks, is fluid. That's where she finds her space, and it's great for people to refer to her in the they-them pronouns. And when referring to, as I said earlier about Mike Tirico, who's, who's the main face and host of the Olympics, refer to them in those pronouns. Okay? That's the narrative that the IOC wants the world to know and will continue to build on. This is why we're talking about it. Just a week right now as I'm recording this from the ending of the Olympics in France. But here's the thing. A trans athlete can undergo hormone therapy to attempt to reduce muscle mass, strength, bone density, and the metabolism. But guess what? No matter what hormone therapy or homo, hormone blockers that somebody goes through, that athlete, in this case, a biological male who's pretending to be a female, is still a male. Because biological sex is, is immutable. It doesn't change. It's a fixed feature of reality. That is what we have to understand. So here in the Alliance Defending Freedom, you see it says some say allowing men and women sports is inclusive, but the opposite is true. When men join women's teams, women are excluded. So what happens when a guy says, this is against my conviction, against my religion? I've worked you know, we, we, we talk about the athlete, but somebody in broadcasting, I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Muslim, I am a Christian, I'm a Jew, I'm a Catholic, whatever. And that goes against my convictions. Nope, if you don't use our pronouns, you're fired. What happens with that? How's that being inclusive? So when you go back to men joining women's teams, it is women who are excluded. So where are the apologies when it comes to Women athletes. I mean, in fact, guess what, you guys? I want to show you guys this. When, when uh, Khalif, when he wins gold, guess what? He files an online harassment complaint after gender controversy. Nothing about the females who worked hard to win gold and lost to a man saying he's a woman. And yet... He files a complaint after gender controversy. That is where we're at. During the run, it says during her run, but during his run at the Olympics, the 25-year-old athlete was bullied on social media. What was he doing in the ring? How is that not bullying women? How is that, sh how is that inclusivity? All they care about is the man who's saying he's a woman. That's the attention that they want, you guys. That's the sad reality. And we're seeing this more and more. I'm going to show you this clip in a minute about, about Ted Cruz, but I want to go back to this. I want to talk about the social norms that the International Olympic Committee is advancing. I want to talk about how they are advancing what is known as this expressive individualism. Remember, when you go back to their sex variation terminology, they use this as an umbrella term that refers to variation in one's sex. Notice linked characteristics. Linked characteristics. What, is, what are those? What does that even mean? The, 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 these are social constructs, you guys, that they put together. That means like their chromosomes or their hormones or their internal organs. And notice they say that do not fit medical and social norms. So if they go through surgery or they call it gender affirmation surgery and their organs don't match what medical procedures they had and they identify now a biological male as a, as, as, as a female, that is what they would call sex variation. So they may have linkage to chromosomes that are XY, meaning that they are a biological male, but it doesn't match how they feel. In the guideline book of the International Olympic Committee, they said, for example, in women, these variations can result in higher than average levels of naturally occurring testosterone. So that's what they want to advance. So when you bring in someone like Nikki Hiltz, she will refer to herself at times as a transgender person. Other times she will refer to herself as a female, but then she wants to be referred to as they, them. But if she's fluid, I don't know. If she doesn't even know, because all of it is determined 
based on social constructs or what is referred to as, as David Wells talks about in his book, Losing Our Virtues, about what is, what's known as expressive individualism. He says, questions of identity today stand at the center of clashing perspectives on how we are to think about the human being. Sociologists are inclined to think of the person as a construct of factors like gender, social roles, social economic status, level of education, and, and ethnicity. On this view, our identity is the story that we weave together out of the roles we fill, the people we know, the attention or lack of it we have received, what we have and how we think of ourselves in relation to society, end quote. That, my friends, is where we are at let me give you guys uh, an example of this that's also not just de being debated on the level of the Olympics worldwide with 200 plus countries, but on, in our own Congress. Take a listen. In your experience, is, is, is there a difference between women and men? Of course. Now, let me just pause for those who are just listening to this podcast. This is Riley Gaines. She was a swimmer, remember? And she lost to Lia Tom Thomas, who just within not even two years when he started to compete on the college level, and Riley Gaines was running, she was swimming for, for, for basically, you know, nationals, highly decorated swimmer, uh, and she loses to a trans woman. And she just, and, and before Congress, and this is Ted Cruz, Senator of Texas, talking to her, and he asked her this question. She's responding. And then we'll get to uh, uh, Human Rights Campaign President Kelly Robinson, who can't even give you a definition of, of, of what a woman or a man is. And Riley had shared the story that when they tied, so good for her, so she even tied in the final race to win the championship. And they gave it to the trans woman. Why? Because they said they needed to. Because that, that, that's more appealing. And if she was a good sport, you know what I mean? It would actually be a favor for the advancement of inclusivity and equality and fairness uh, with, this, with this trans woman swimmer. So no, notice how she's clearly defining that there is a distinction between men and women in sports. I think we learned this at a very young age, watching even 12 and unders play. Going through puberty causes irreversible um, advantage that no matter the training, no matter the diet, no matter any alterable um, change you can make will overcome that male advantage. Especially in sports like swimming where lung capacity matters so much. Um, even something as silly as throat size, men have on average a 40% larger throat, which sounds like it's nothing. But when you're grasping for air, that 40% larger throat makes a huge difference in athletic success, not to mention height. Um, you guys know the differences. Ms. Robinson, do you agree with Ms. Gaines that there's a difference between women and men? If the question is about trans women... I'm just asking, is there a difference between women and men? I mean, what I can say here is that the NCAA has rules in place. They've had rules in place for the last decade, and when this competition okay, okay, happened, I'm, I'm gonna try the again. rules were clear. Do you believe there's a difference between women and men? It, it's a yes-no question. It, is, it, do you believe there's a difference? Oh, I think that we're talking about this case with the NCAA. No, I'm asking a question. Do you believe there's a difference between women and men? Most I, people could answer this very simply. I, I'm curious if you're willing to do so. Oh, absolutely. I'm just putting it into the context of is the that conversation yes? that we're having. I think that there are definitions related is, is, to sex. Is, is that a yes? Yeah. So I'm that trying to get a yes or no. I'm not trying to get, get a speech. It, oh, I, is I'm, there a difference between women and men? I think that there are definitions for biological sex. Okay, so you're not answering that. Let me gender. ask you this question then. Why do women's sports exist? If you can't define a difference between women and men, why not abolish women's sports and just tell little girls to swim with little boys and see who wins? Oh, I'm simply saying that um, that sex is My different question, than gender. Why and I do, do believe why that women's, women's sports, sports have a great exist? value. I mean, Senator, I'll M tell you right Ms. now. Ms. Robinson, please answer the question I'm asking you. Absolutely. Why do women's sports exist? I think that there are so many positive benefits to sports. But I mean, why have a separate category for women? If, if, you, if there's no difference between women and men, why to have women's sports? 
I'm saying that there's a difference between sex and gender and that the NCAA has rules in place, which they have for the so last Mr. decade. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to enter into the record an, an article. So you guys see, this is the tactics that a lot of people like Callie Robinson from the human rights campaign like to do. They like to say that there's a distinction between sex. So when you're talking about women's sports that are female, they're biological uh, females versus a trans female. And they call it in the gender category, hence gender identity. No, it, it's they're both synonymous. The gender language, this is what it does. It becomes a social norm. And this is arbitrary. So whether it's the International Olympics Committee adhering to these social norms, those are arbitrary. Or human rights campaign, their view of mankind is arbitrary. Or when it comes to GLAD who co-created these portrayal guidelines. Those are arbitrary. They do not fully encapsulate the genuine beauty that is inherent in the distinct qualities of a man and a woman, respectively. The duality of male and female is the pinnacle of God's creation that uniquely we are the only creation in God's created order that reflect the image of our maker. I always love Dr. Robert Gagnon's pointed remarks referring to the maleness and femaleness that makes up humanity. He says, quote, the sacred integrity of maleness and femaleness is stamped on one's body. And so here you have Senator Cruz is asking just a very direct question. What is the distinction? What is the difference between male and female sports? It's that obvious. And yet, these progressive people who want to try to advance fairness and equality, they don't even know what they believe. But my friends, we shouldn't be surprised because the one thing that I want us to understand is that we are definitely in a time, as Romans 1 talks about, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's what we're told in scripture. We are told in verse 21 that they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They became fools, we're told in verse 22. We're told in verse 24 that their lusts began to increase for more impurity and their dishonoring of their bodies because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. That's what we're told. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're told that the days will become more darkened. And notice that there's going to be this rebellion and the man of lawlessness, this deception. Remember, Satan is the great deceiver. I believe this is referring to the son of perdition or more, or more uh, pointedly or the portrayal uh, in the culture today is more known as the Antichrist this son of destruction or the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship that is going to come into this world that people are going to fall prey to. And notice it says in verse nine, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And it tells us in verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. So every time you guys, when you see something that is so obvious to distinguish or to know the difference of, or when somebody says there is no truth, but they're using truth to deny it, which is a contradiction. We know the law of non-tradition exists, that it's real then we know that that which is true about truth is that it's transcendent, it's real, it's universal, and it's exclusive. You can't deny it without affirming it. And so when you see this happening, when somebody can't even tell you what a woman is, they can't even tell you what a man is, and people are trying to distinguish between sex and gender like they're so smart. No, they're cunning there's a strong delusion. They're believing that which is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure 
and unrighteousness. That's what we're seeing. But I pray that we as Christians, as we are dealing with these type of things, whether it's examining trans athletes in your community, having a discussion with somebody at your church about these things, we have to remember that these are social constructs that are advancing what is known as expressive individualism that in no way, shape, or form holds to the beauty in the inherent and intrinsic dignity of man and woman, respectively. And we as Christians, even though we know that people were told in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. So we see in Romans chapter 1 that they suppress the truth. Uh, we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is that they distort it. And we see in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, they will blaspheme it. But we are to take heart. We are to take heart. We are not to fall prey to this distortion, to this growing deception. But instead, I pray as we have these challenging conversations, and they could be disturbing. And I pray that if you guys are upset by this, that you would pray and that you would seek the Lord and you will remain steadfast, that you will hold fast to God's truth and that you will remember what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He says, continue to be trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine. My friends, that is only found in Jesus Christ. So no matter what is happening around the world, God has ordained you in me to be here such a time as this, to pray against the darkness, to listen to podcasts like this, and to do something about it, to be grounded, to be trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine. So if you are married, if you're a man, you're married to a woman, you're a woman, you're married to a man, use that as a model to highlight God's beauty of what marriage is. This is not a competition against other, all quote, alternative marriages, because there's only one marriage, and that's between a man and a woman. Satan tries to copy and distort in the process God's order and say, no, this is the real way. This is a progressive way. This is a more enlightened way. This is the modern way. No. So be a model, but also don't fall prey to these pronouns. Don't fall prey to these social constructs. Don't fall prey to sex and gender being two separate things. Don't fall, uh, fall prey to these sex variations. Know the difference. And as a Christian, jump into these discussions. Don't be unafraid. Be an advocator of God's truth. That's why I do this podcast to help you guys stand strong in your faith and not to give up. So if you want to learn how you can do that effectively. I encourage you guys, not just listening to this podcast, and I appreciate if you guys listen to this podcast and you find it to be not just refreshing, but it helps you guys uh, to jump into some of these things that you want to talk about, but you're too afraid maybe to talk about it. Leave us a review. Wherever you get your podcasts, please leave us a review because that helps grow this platform to reach more people just like you with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to teaching us how to stand strong in our faith. But you could go to standstrongministries.org and you can see all of the resources that we have available, articles, books that I've written. The, the latest few that I've written in the past few years is Challenging Conversation, which we started this podcast. Many of you guys who are faithful listeners know that. We are developing a, a new video series that's going to be coming out, so we'll be letting all of you guys know about that on the podcast when that happens. This is going to be a great opportunity for you guys to dive deep into controversial topics and know how as a Christian to winsomely and respectfully engage the culture for Christ. Uh, number two uh, is hijacking Jesus. So if you've been in a situation where you've talked to a progressive, a liberal, or somebody who's woke, and you want to know what that's all about and how to defend the historic Christian faith, hijacking Jesus, how progressive Christians are remaking him, taking over the church is an excellent resource that you guys can get wherever books are sold. And you can check that out on my website. And also, Parenting Gen Z. If you are a parent or a grandparent or you work with this generation that are now graduating high school and college and you want to learn how you can reach them for Christ, get my book with Focus on the Family called Parenting Gen Z. So with that, my friends, I thank you guys for being faithful listeners and know that we are here to help you guys, to arm and to prepare you, to train you 
to be the Christians that God has called you to be. So until next time, keep having those challenging conversations.